These men are Bijagos, members of an ethnic group from Guinea-Bissau in Western Africa. They begin their initiation at the age of 12. During the two weeks before leaving for the forest to accomplish the final steps towards making them respected men, they dance every evening. To overcome the terrible ordeals that await them, they rely on the energy which the shark dance gives them. The shark is the incarnation of wildness, strength, aggression, and sexual potency. By imitating him, the men learn to control and to channel the raw animal energy inside themselves. Here, the shark is neither good nor evil, but simply a force of nature. How is he looked upon elsewhere? What place does this magnificent predator occupy in man's imagination? This is what we are going to discover on a journey that will take us from the Orient to the Occident, through legends, religious beliefs, and myths. But first, where did the shark come from? When and how did man first come into contact with him? The evolution of sharks began 400 million years ago. We can distinguish two important periods. The initial period was during the first era, between 400 and 200 million years ago. We have groups of armored fish called placoderms, which were probably the ancestors of the shark. During this first era, we can recognize sharks by their teeth, their ventricles, and their spiked bodies. The second period was during the second era. First, placoderms disappeared and sharks diversified. In the middle of this era, which we call Jurassic, the age of dinosaurs, we see almost all forms of sharks as we know them today. So we can say that when man appeared three million years ago, Lucy could have been familiar with all forms of existent sharks, such as the great white shark, the mako, the sand tiger shark, and of course the famous megalodon, which disappeared about a million years ago, and who left us these gigantic teeth. The megalodon was the size of a whale shark, with the aggressive nature of its contemporary cousin, the great white shark. He was a true Tyrannosaurus of the sea, whose favorite prey was the whale. Fortunately, he disappeared before Lucy's descendants learned how to swim. We don't know when or how the first significant encounters between man and shark took place, although we suppose there were something like these images. Archaeological sites have revealed that at least 40,000 years ago, man, in search of food, realized the importance of fish, and before he developed specific fishing techniques, used the only techniques he knew, the ones he used for hunting. Armed probably with a pointed wooden stake, he would hunt for fish at the water's edge. Later, after becoming an underwater hunter, man and the shark became competitors, with the shark fighting hard to steal his opponent's prey. Archaeological finds indicate that these initial encounters, which sometimes led to confrontation, took place in a very auspicious area, the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean, where the relief, often of volcanic or coral origin, formed shallow, warm-water lagoons. 
Man still lives there in close symbiosis with the sea, since in these regions, the marine animal biodiversity is greater than that of land animals, and thus a primary resource. These Pacific paradise-like islands were totally colonized in the space of 30,000 years. Two main oceanic cultures developed, the Polynesian and the Melanesian. What were the beliefs of these men and women who sailed thousands of kilometers going from island to island? How did they imagine the world? What was man's place in the scheme of things? What was the animal's place, and among them, the great predator, the shark? Before being converted to Christianity, which we estimate at about the mid-18th century, oceanic people were polytheistic. In addition, their relationship with nature was such that they considered the elements in nature as possessing the same characteristics as man. Therefore, exchanges between man and nature were extremely important. These ocean-dwelling societies lived in almost total harmony with the sea and felt there was practically no break between island and ocean or earth and sea. And in this world in which earth and sea were one, the shark was a sort of king. The peoples of the Pacific are the only ones to have turned the shark into a true symbol. In their oral tradition societies, mythology still plays a role on the spirits and influences people's behavior, practices, and symbols. In spite of modernization, certain attitudes regarding nature and more particularly the shark have been either openly perpetuated or hidden under a cloud of Christianity going back only two or three centuries. In the Salomon Island village of Laulasi, when someone dies, his body is offered to the sharks. Only the head is conserved in small bamboo traps. By talking to the shark, we speak to our ancestors, whose spirit lives on in the animal's body. It's these same ancestors who ask the living to dance and to offer sacrifices in honor of Bakwa, the shark god, since he has the power to make fishing abundant and to prevent shark attacks. This pig is about to be sacrificed. A few generations ago, before the intervention of missionaries, the sacrifices were human. The women sing, imploring Bakwa to protect their husbands and their children. People spend several hours a day here in shark-infested waters, and they claim that no one has ever been attacked, except for one man who didn't believe in Bakwa's power. A little later, the pig's entrails are offered to the sharks. According to the Laulasi, if Bakwa accepts the offering, this shark will be the first to eat. If the small black spotted sharks take the food first, it is considered a bad omen, signifying that Bakwa has not listened to the men's prayers. In the end, however, 
the sacred shark takes the sacrifice. And the other sharks will only share what's left over. The entire village sings and dances for joy. Once again, the natural order has been respected. Not very far north, at Kantu, in Papua New Guinea, the shark is the central figure of a magical and sacred ritual. The shark callers, as the men call themselves, prove their courage and their strength by capturing the animal. They call him by stirring up the water with a noisemaker made of coconuts woven together on a vine. They capture the shark with a slipknot and a wooden floater carved in the form of a propeller. Moreau tells the men to summon the sharks with magic. He has also given men the power to communicate with their ancestors. It all began with Moroa. In the beginning, he created the shark. And then later, he created man and gave him these powers. But the first shark was caught by Moroa. It was Moroa? Yes. At dawn, he went to sea in his boat. He shook the coconuts, and the shark appeared. His magic had worked. It was the same magic we use today. By Moroa, you mean God? The Christian church and the government call him God. But in our language, he is Moroa. Moroa also insisted that man not have sexual relations or eat land animals before leaving to capture the shark. When going out to sea, one must make a complete break with the land. If a fisherman transgresses this law, he will fail. His magic will not work. 